Father, we thank you. We thank you for the seasons of work and seasons of rest, Lord, that you give us, Lord. And uh, I just pray for each one here in today's class. Um, Father God, um, I pray that uh, uh, you'd give them seasons of rest, Lord, that they would be rest for the mind, rest for the body, uh, refreshing for the spirit, Lord. And I pray that each one of us, we will intentionally um, take time to do that, Lord, be it... Uh, Lord, a few hours uh, uh, just to pursue things, uh, just to be quiet, uh, Lord, just to do those things that would recharge, refresh us, and uh, and above all, to to be in your presence, to have those constant conversations, Lord, every day, every moment with you. And I just um, want to thank you for all the young parents who are in the classroom, and uh, uh, just come with them into your mighty hands. I pray for the grace uh, or, uh, or pouring of your grace upon them. And uh, I just pray that you'll give them the wisdom and to enjoy this season of uh, parenting, Lord. I pray that uh, it'll be a, a joyful season, God, and uh, that they will look back uh, and uh, in, in thanksgiving, in praise to you. And I just pray for wisdom that they will bring up the little ones, uh, Lord, in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I just pray that little ones also will get to just love you and know you and have encounters with you. And um, I just pray that it will be a very natural overflow, God. And I, I just pray for conversations in the household, God, that uh, conversations about you, uh, testimonies about you, Father God, that church will not be one compartment, uh, something for one day of the week, but church will be every day. And uh, I pray that faith will be so real and authentic, oh God, in all these households, Father God. I pray that, um, yeah, that you would have your way, that uh, you would draw each of these little ones close to you, God. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting that we started talking about parents and, uh, you know, parenting. Um, because um, the church is much like that, you know, as a, uh, you see that church is a family. Uh, we see that church is, uh, yeah, church is an army. Um, we see that church is the bride of Christ. Um, church is the house of prayer. You know, you, uh, we've seen that, all those pictures of uh, church, the blueprint of church, um, the house of God that we see in scripture. So a uh, church is all there. And one of the things is that it's a family, it's a community. And we see, um, you know, people of, uh, uh, well, uh, we see uh, like when uh, Peter addresses, um, uh, you know, he talks about uh, young men, he talks about, uh, you know, old men, he talks about uh, children. And, um, uh, you know, the thing is that, um, these are people uh, with winning maturity and uh, you have all uh, all of them in the church and um, and and some of us some of you are uh, you know raised up as spiritual leaders right spiritual leaders in the body of christ and uh, and having to um, you see the parallel running the household and having to uh, you know extend spiritual leadership over the, over the house of god and you have you know all, all the mix of all, all these um, you know, the people in varying levels uh, as children, as young men, as uh, as mature uh, adults, and uh, so to uh, to interact, to deal, uh, and to uh, and to nurture, right? Uh, to correct, all those things are, are part of uh, the role of the pastor, right? Uh, and as a spiritual leader as well right so um so today as we look at uh, you know we continue to look at uh, the roles and rewards of the pastor and uh, we look at uh, uh, the uh, first first timothy i think we started looking at uh, started going through first timothy so as we go through first timothy we go to second timothy and uh, and glean some things some learnings from there which we can use in uh, uh, you know spiritual leadership you understand that okay this this is what uh, you know being a pastor entails right um and we also i, I just thought today we'll also look at uh, two um uh, you know two chapters from the book code of honor so if you already downloaded that you can uh, you know you can just open it up uh, uh, but otherwise i'll also try uh, projecting it i have got a download here right so um now, uh, yeah, uh, some of the things from there, uh, principles uh, of ministry and uh, and so on, personal life. Uh, so I just thought we'd look at two things. One is uh, to uh, with regard to ministry of the word, and the other one with uh, regard to relating with people. 
now people and preaching right so both are uh, both are very much there and um, uh, important uh, for uh, especially for uh, uh, the role of the pastor right so we we'll kind of look at that uh, in today's class right okay so let's um, let's turn to uh, first timothy if you have your bibles um, let's uh, let's look at uh, i think we uh, we looked at first timothy chapter 4 right where paul um, says uh, let no one despise your youth. Now uh, you're a young person. Uh, uh, Timothy was a young person in Ephesus, so he's saying, "Let no one look down on your youth or despise your youth, um, but you be above reproach in in your life, right? In your uh, be an example uh, to the believers." And he lists down six things, and he says, "Be an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity." Um, and again, goes back to you know. Uh, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So um, the word of God being very, very central to everything uh, that a minister of God does, and uh, especially uh, typically for the pastoral ministry as well. Um, and of course, he says, do not neglect, verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. So, so the gifts. You know, we know that uh, for um, uh, like God does not just say, okay, try and figure out. You know, there are certain things which we, you know, which God has given us the freedom with regard to um, church structure, church governance, and and so on. Leader, um, um, you know, He's given us the freedom, the flexibility. But along with that comes the wisdom. And the guidance, right? We can always ask him. So um, we don't have to, you know, try to reinvent the wheel, try to figure things out. Uh, but you know, uh, but, but the thing is, we need to understand that you know, there's so much of difference, right? In in culture, in the kind of people that uh, the church is, uh, and uh, whether it's rural, whether it's urban. So there's so much of freedom and flexibility that we have uh, in in giving that leadership, right? Um, but we can always um, depend on the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so Paul is saying, do not neglect the gift. So with the gifting, with the call, comes the anointing or the empowering by the Spirit of God. So, um, so he empowers in order for us to carry out the task, whether it's um, you know whether it's the evangelist or the teacher or the pastor. Uh, along with the call comes the empowering. Right. Um, and uh, and along with the empowering, we know that the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, he comes and indwells us. And, uh, and there are certain things which begin to, um, you know, uh, manifest uh, as gifts um, because of the role. Right. And uh, and so Paul is here reminding, don't neglect that gift. OK. Uh, and he tells he reminds Timothy again. You know, as a as an overseer, uh, don't neglect again. You know, our God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, and that is also in the context of the gift which is um, which is in Timothy, which Paul has recognized. You know, and and as a spiritual leader, uh, uh, and which who whom Timothy is, Paul is reminding him, don't neglect that gift. Um, you know, because that gift is for the edification of the body so don't neglect it so he, he's saying you know do not neglect the gift which was given to you uh, when we commissioned you right and take heed to the doctrine to the teaching continue in them uh, for in doing so you will save both yourself and those who hear you so we see that uh, you know like we saw in the old testament uh, in in the book of Ezekiel, that the pastoral role is to feed, you know, the the feed the the ones uh, who are whom the pastor has been called to shepherd. And um, does anyone remember, uh, you know, what is that Greek word uh, which um, which refers, uh, you know, the Greek word used to um, uh, typically used as uh, uh, for the pastor, you know, which we see in Ephesians four eleven also the Greek word which is used there. Um, anyone? It, it's a word which means shepherd or a herdsman. And uh, okay, in we in the Greek, it uh, it means uh, okay. Uh, I think this is how it's spelled uh, in English: poimen or poima, poiman or poimen. 
um, which means a shepherd or a herdsman, uh, one who tends to the flocks, right? Okay, so um, uh, chapter five. Uh, so here we we see um, again Paul uh, writing Timothy and saying, okay, this is another facet of uh, being a pastor, right? The role of the pastor, which is uh, which is bringing in correction. Right? bringing in correction, bringing in uh, alignment, and it's uh, with people. So, um, so Paul uh, writes this. He says, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, uh, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. Right? So uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, correction, Yes, people are not aligned to the truth. People are, uh, you know, we need to, one thing we need to understand is, um, you know, quite unlike um, the role of the uh, evangelist, which which would be uh, typically uh, covering geographical territory uh, physically. And uh, like in terms of travel, uh, uh, having an itinerary uh, ministry, uh, itinerant, uh, being an itinerant minister, the teacher also to some extent, right? Um, when we look at some of the teachers and how, so uh, that also could be itinerant, right? Whereas the pastor, for the most part, is uh, is actually stationary. Right? It's not an itinerant ministry uh, unless you know uh, a, an evangelistic or an apostolic call is also there, where it's a church planting, uh, you know, ministry and uh, and. Uh, uh, and an apostolic call, so which means to you know go into areas, pioneer new ministries, and so on, or an evangelistic uh, uh, gift also operating. So, um, so the thing is, uh, so for for the past, for the most part, the pastoral ministry is stationary. So, which means uh, engaging with people over and over again, uh, you know, maybe, uh, and and with the nurturing aspect also comes the correcting and so on. So Paul writes and he says, you know, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort as uh, as a father and so on. Right? And then uh, you see that there is the spiritual aspect to be taken care of and, and also, and which is very, very uh, crucial. Uh, and also uh, some of the natural or the, uh, what I would say, you know, some organizational aspects of um, of the ministry as a pastor, you know, some administrative tasks, um, which, uh, which I'm sure you will learn in, uh, you know, church administration, um, and which you can use for other ministries also. You know, it's, if it's not a church ministry, the principles can be employed in other, uh, you know, areas of ministry as well. But uh, you know, church administration typically talks about the church, the body of Christ, the local church. Um, so you, of course, you will, you know, learn a lot more there in that uh, course. Uh, but here, you know, you see that uh, the reality is that there is uh, uh, some amount of works and administration that come with the with the gift with the ministry, right? So he uh, writes about that, especially about the widows and uh, how you know, and goes into details of uh, what should be done and so on, right? Um, then in verse seventeen. Um, talks about elders, uh, these are people who are, again, uh, spiritual overseers. Right? Uh, it talks about bishops. Then um, here in verse 17, it talks about uh, it talks about elders. Uh, verse Timothy chapter 5, right? Um, let me just pull up that verse 5 and verse 17. OK. Yeah, uh, I think someone had a question. Yes, uh, Mangi, you can. You have a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, this uh, in chapter five, verse seventeen. Uh, yeah. This issue raises a lot of trouble in, in the church, where mm -hmm. they say that uh, some pastors must 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 get paid a lot of money, while others get like overseer pastor get paid uh, more money than anyone else in the church. I know we, we are not supposed to, to save God for, for money or for any uh, material material gain, but also people still have to live. Mm. So, and whenever people raise the issue of, of uh, uh, being 
being uh, rewarded for what they do, they they bring up this this verse here. Say that the, the overseer or the the elder is mm. is worthy of of dub, dub, double reward, even though other people work under him. They, they also need need to to survive. So, what can you advise on this one? Yeah, yeah. So, um, thanks, Maggie, for that question. So, the thing is, um, you know, the, this. Uh, what is laid down here, of course, it it, sh it should not be, uh, uh, you know, uh, used for manipulation or or, a, or as a sense of entitlement. But really, um, uh, Paul writes down, he says, you know, those who rule well, okay, those who labor in the word and doctrine, uh, let them be counted worthy of double honor. Okay. And, uh, you know, verse 18, he also backs it up with scripture. And he says, you know, in the Old Testament, yes, you do not muzzle an ox or, or, ox or you know, tie the mouth of an ox as it's threshing out the grain. Uh, because if it grabs the mouthful, it's okay. Um, uh, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay. So, um, so the thing is to really, uh, you know, as a, so how do we do it honorably? How do we do it uh, in a way that's uh, that's uh, honors God that uh, that does not belittle man, does does not bring in abuse. So, so we do it in the most God honoring manner, in the sense that you know, if there is a if there is a leadership, then you lay down. Okay, these are you know this this is the need of the of the person uh, and this is the kind of city that they are living in or a village that they are living in and this is the cost of living and uh, you know in in modern terms you know in uh, uh, today you know, that is what we would look at we would look at you know the qualifications the experience and also the size of the household the the place where they are you know, ministering, um, and and the need that they might be facing uh, because of the place, also the cost of living, etc., and uh, and a remuneration that the church can afford um, based on whatever the income is, uh, and you make it official, right? You um, so so that's that's about it, you know. And uh, and the word elder again means uh, you know presbyteros. You know, someone who's having oversight. So, so if the uh, you know this again uh, talks about um, um, you know the the laborer is worthy of his wages. So he talks about talks about someone who is uh, obviously someone not volunteering their time, but someone who's serving, or doing this full time, and uh, you know as part of an agreement, maybe serving as a staff in today's you know, term, we would we would say you know, someone who's serving. So it can be done in the most God honoring manner, where everyone comes under, you know, uh, submits to one another, and there is an agreement and saying, okay, this is what it is, right? Um, now, uh, right, for example, uh, you know, uh, for many years, I would say, you know, the senior pastor of ABC did not take a salary because the vocation as a, a, a in the IT business so he did not take a salary for for many years um, so so things like that you know you set an example and say okay uh, this is what it is I have this so uh, my needs are met so therefore you know I'm not going to so so you have those examples as well so um, so to not really abuse this scripture but to do it in a very God honoring uh, manner right so yeah the other question is how many elders should a congregation have well uh, we don't have any uh, any such specifics but i guess it it would depend on the you know size of the congregation if it's a if it's a big obviously a thousand two thousand member congregation then uh, based on the needs spiritual needs of the people you could have more people um, um, yeah, we're welcome, Mangi. So more people taking care. Um, so that's about it. So we don't have even in terms of structure. You know, there is this flexibility um, so because of the kind of church. You know, it could be a house church. It could be a, a church in a, a you know a, a, wherever geographically it's located, uh, or it could be a or it could be you know whatever God has graced that particular church to be. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, it depends on that, right? Yeah. Okay, hope that helps, Kennedy. Right. 
Okay, so uh, so the elders who rule well, which means that uh, yeah, you know, there is a sense of appraisal also, you know, appraisal or review to see uh, you know how are they serving. Okay, so uh, so you could do that as well, and and uh, it's interesting that uh, Paul mentions that who rules well, which means how do you know that they rule well unless you observed, unless you've taken note of what they're doing, and. Um, and uh, maybe have some criteria for you know uh, in whatever area of um, that they are doing, um, you know uh, what what are those key, uh, you know in management terms you would say KRAs you know key result areas. Um, so what are those areas that you can define? So so you can at least you know look at those areas and see okay this is what we were uh, looking at and uh, so yeah. Um, should a woman serve as a church elder? Yeah, by all means. There's no, um, you know, there's no uh, restriction, uh, Kennedy, uh, uh, with regard to you know any of the fivefold uh, ministries. Uh, you know, the the there's no like we've been studying. We've been looking at you know apostles being you know women being apostles, women being you know uh, uh, other uh, ministry offices also. So yeah, so so similar. Similarly, uh, a woman can serve as an elder, but different churches, uh, I know, you know, certain churches have a, uh, have a very strong uh, opinion, uh, stand that only, there should be only male leadership, which restricts women from being leaders or being, um, you know, which confines women to only uh, maybe children's ministry or, you know, ministry to women and so on. Some churches have such a thing, but we don't really see that in scripture. Like how we've been studying, you know, and especially those two, uh, those two challenging uh, scriptures, right in one Corinthians fourteen, and also in uh, First Timothy chapter two. Um, um, so First Timothy, sorry, First Timothy uh, is it two? Yeah, two and le uh, verse eleven. So, so based on that, uh, I guess uh, there's been uh, you know uh, some restrictions on women in some denominations or some churches but uh, but really if you look at scripture you you don't see that yeah okay okay so um yeah so let's uh, let's move on let's look at um, uh, uh, you know verse 17 so this is what he says uh, you you consider and then you you see if they've been serving well, if they've been, um, um, so because the labor is worthy of his wages. Okay. Then again about correction. Uh, so you see the role of the, you know, role of the pastor uh, overseeing all this. So, so there is this administrative side, there is the, the spiritual side, there is the natural side, there is, a, a, you know, the other things, the organizational thing uh, to look into, right? So here, uh, verse 19 onwards, he talks about uh, you know if there is an accusation okay, against an elder, so which means the scenario is okay. Here's a church in Ephesus. There are elders, there are bishops, there are deacons, and uh, uh, here is Timothy, who is a young man who is uh, giving oversight, and and Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, you know, if there is an accusation against an elder, do not receive it except from two or three witnesses, which means that if it's a one-off thing, wait and see, is there a pattern? And if there are two or three witnesses uh, to the same kind of uh, complaint against uh, or accusation against an elder, uh, whatever be the case, you know, um, if there are two or three, then you need to receive it. And, uh, uh, you know, you need to correct, right? And of, of course, um, you know, this, uh, the second one, the verse following that, uh, verse 20 also has been misused right in very uh, in many circles those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear okay those who are sinning which means those who are continuing to sin right those who are continuing in a lifestyle of sin um, uh, but the thing is we know the 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 model which the lord jesus laid out that uh, you know if if you have um, uh, yeah, Kennedy, I'm just coming to that. Uh, so if, uh, uh, you know, if there is a, uh, if there's an, uh, you know, a person who's sinning, then the, the Lord says, you you go and try settle it personally. But if it does not, then you take 
two or three witnesses with you. And even the, after that, if he does not, then let him be to you uh, as a, you know, as an out, as an outcast in the sense, right? So you take a stronger measure. So um, here also, it, it talks about someone who is um, continuing in sin, right? So, so as a as a overseer, spiritual leader, um, Timothy has to address that. So that comes with the ministry of the pastor. So those who are sinning. So you reach that place, verse twenty, uh, rebuke in the presence of all. So obviously, it is. Uh, affecting, influencing the flock, influencing the uh, the the church, right? Uh, in a negative manner, maybe it's causing division, maybe it's causing you know all kinds of confusion. So, um, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. Okay, um, yeah. So yeah, the question is: Can an elder drink wine in moderation? You know, this again, you know. Um, I know there are churches who, uh, you know, who talk about uh, drinking wine or alcohol in moderation because, uh, you know, Paul writes and he says, uh, uh, you know, verse uh, chapter three, verse three, not given to wine. Okay, it means that it's not uh, uh, his, his disposition is not to, you know, drink and keep drinking, and uh, and he repeats that uh, again in. To the deacon, not given too much wine. So the 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 question is is you know is some wine okay? Right. Uh, but the thing is, knowing the potential of uh, you know this is practical uh, uh, advice and opinion, uh, knowing the potential that wine or alcohol uh, can have uh, in a person's life, knowing the doors that it can open, uh, knowing that people uh, have some predisposition to addiction to alcohol. Uh, and also the fact that it's a cultural taboo in certain certain societies, and what we see in Corinthians as uh, you know, uh, not only take care of yourself, but you consider the one who is weaker, right? The one who is maybe coming out of addiction, uh, and and given all that, um, you know, what uh, we as a church and ministry advocate is complete abstinence from wine or any form of alcohol um yeah for the for the leadership for the for the ones who are serving as volunteers and also the ones who are on staff as pastors and as uh, spiritual leaders um is uh, uh, complete abstinence there is also a message on that um i'll try to find the link and you can listen to it and uh, and see if it makes sense right so this is the a reason why you say okay no to wine and no to alcohol uh, while we understand that it's in some churches in some cultures uh, it is permissible but one one has to ask the question uh, i know it is permissible but is it helpful <clears throat> you know is it helping the one who is a, a weaker brother or am i being a stumbling block you know so that's the i think those are the questions we need to ask uh, um, in answering this Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so then we uh, we we come to us. So I hope you understand the context of verse twenty. Right. It's it's not that uh, because many have done that and uh, it's it's hurt people and destroyed people's lives. Right. So the thing is uh, to to exhaust the other two steps before. Um, so it is a something that is continuing, uh, and it's a pattern. It's a lifestyle. Um, so you know you exhaust the first two, and before you actually come to the third step, which is um, to rebuke in the presence of all, right? And uh, and sometimes even the uh, you know the extreme measure of uh, telling the person not to be part of the fellowship because um, it is uh, it is causing division it is causing a uh, problem it, the the people in the fellowship of the church are being affected right uh, because of uh, one person or group of people's uh, lifestyle and how they are and what they are doing right um, so that is uh, that's the you know the extreme measure okay um so verse 21 Again, while dealing with people, we'll come to that. So do everything without prejudice, uh, without any partiality. Do nothing 
with partiality um, because it's dealing with people. Yes, some people can be very, very uh, irritating. Uh, some people can be very nice. But when you're, you know, when when you have to uh, judge between or discern, or, uh, judge I think is a, you know when you have to um, say this is right or this is wrong. You know, you need to do that without uh, prejudice and without any partiality. You know, uh, because uh, human nature, this person is nice, and you tend to you know, uh, extend a little more grace maybe. And a person has been very, very, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, um, irritating and uh, and very disrespectful and uh, the same grace is not extended in such cases. But then he's saying, no, if, you, if you're doing one to the, uh, the other person, you know, you do to this person as well, right? So do nothing uh, without partiality, okay? Uh, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. So this laying on of hands, uh, uh, and, and he also continues by saying, nor share in other people's sins, keep yourself pure. Okay, So uh, purity, holiness, integrity, we know is, uh, you know, is, is a given, is a foundation. There's no uh, question of compromising on that, right? So Paul is reiterating that. And, and, and the other thing is, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Here he's referring to uh, laying hands and commissioning uh, uh, a person as a, elder or a leader uh, as an overseer over people okay so um so he's talking of he's talking about that okay um do not lay hands on anyone hastily okay uh, we we see that you know when they um when they commissioned elders uh, we see in paul's uh, uh, ministry uh, journeys if you look at uh, the book of acts uh, in i think it uh, Um, okay, um, so we see in Acts chapter 14 that they went, they exhorted, they appointed elders in every church and uh, pray, fasting, they commanded, com commended them to the Lord and so on right so um, so they they do that uh, so it is uh, a work of uh, commissioning uh, that paul is uh, referring to and also you know when he when he talks to talks about uh, timothy uh, himself in the earlier uh, verse uh, earlier chapter first chapter um, uh, we see that uh, it was a, it was an act of uh, commissioning they lay hands prayed and uh, you know, uh, prayed for the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts to be stirred up, and so on. Um, again, in in Second Timothy, also we see that. So they saying, do not uh, lay hands on anyone hastily, referring to uh, appointing spiritual leaders. So, so we see that uh, that responsibility is part part of the raising up spiritual leaders and. Uh, Appointing spiritual leaders, appointing elders is also part of the uh, the ministry work of the pastor. And uh, so here's the caution: you know, do not do that hastily. And he also cautions uh, earlier in chapter three the same thing, right? Um, let them be tested. Let them not be a novice or a uh, you know a, a new believer or an inexperienced person or a immature person, uh, lest they become puffed up lest they become prideful and come under the same condemnation as the uh, as the devil right so do not lay hands etc uh he says then you see in chapter six that uh, talks about employee employer relationship um and so on right so we see that he covers quite a bit of uh, this responsibility because it's uh it's with people and your journey with people uh, covers quite a bit of, uh, you know, quite a uh, bit of categories, right? A number of categories. Their spiritual life, you know, uh, the important thing about doctrine, about uh, being rooted in the word, uh, and so on. The spiritual aspect of it, the core. Then goes on to, um, you know, the uh, their life, the family. Um, then the administrative side of things, correction, um, bringing in correction, bringing in 
strong correction um, and taking those decisions um, also deals with uh, enlisting people, raising up people, enlisting them, uh, commissioning them for ministry, uh, observing the uh, their ministry, uh, observing the work and uh, appraising their work, reviewing the work, and uh, and also rewarding appropriately, right? Uh, so it involves it's 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 like a full package. Uh, it involves a whole lot of that. Um, so so the thing is, uh, sometimes um, we uh, we think, okay, you know, is this really spiritual work? right uh, sometimes we uh, uh, you know maybe the we our heart goes out to you know the spiritual nature uh, spiritual nature of the work i mean or in the sense uh, you know ministering the word and prayer and uh, uh, and, uh, and and prophesying and and intercession and all that right um, but when we when we look deeper we see that all this is also part of the ministry of the pastor, right? All this is part of it. So Paul has to write down, he, he you know, lays out all these instructions very clearly. Um, some things sometimes are just some some things are just principles. Uh, it doesn't give out specifics, but some are you know like specific things when it comes to uh, rebuke and correction and so on. So um, so we see that uh, you know this is it. So so. Maybe you know if you're called to be a pastor, if you're called to you know that kind of a ministry, then it's earlier on itself. It's it's better to settle in our hearts that it, this is part of ministry, right? Um, and uh, and there's no need to you know not give it importance. Uh, we we must because the organizational the 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 people side of things, the uh, administrative side of things, um, if ignored, you know that can become a point of tension and also affect the spiritual side of it, right? So, so, so there is there is always a you know wholesome thing. Both need to be weighed, both need to be addressed, and both need to be both are equally quote unquote spiritual, right? Um, so that is something that we need to bear in mind. Okay, so um, then um, ch chapter six, you know, about workplace, about bond servants and employees, employers, and so on. Um, and also uh, goes on to uh, some more, you know, chapter, uh, verse three onwards, if anyone teaches otherwise, okay, here are these people and they're not, uh, you know, who are under you, you are giving them over oversight, spiritual oversight, and the leaders, you know, if, they are, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Okay, so qualifying all that. Someone does not teach, does not consent, you know, you need to understand that they are proud, they are obsessed with disputes. I'm reading from verse four. Uh, paraphrasing verse four, uh, obsessed with disputes, arguments over words, uh, from which come, which is the source of envy, strife, reviling, evil, suspicions. Okay, uh, and from such, he says, withdraw yourself. Again, uh, you know, it's it's again, you know, people are uh, you have that conversation, and then they are still very, very. Uh, you know, uh, opinionated and and they're continuing to do this, then, you know, it is a source of, they are a source of envy, uh, bringing in envy, bringing in strife, reviling evil suspicions and, and the whole package into the body. So you withdraw. Okay. Um, he will uh, again, you know, talk about, uh, talk about this saying that, you know, you need to, uh, you, you need to put away that person from among you, a divisive person. You know he says in the second episode, right? So you see this, and and then again, uh, the, it, we know that it involves uh, ministry involves money, the work involves money. Um, so Paul writes about that, and he says the love of money is a root. Okay, the love of money is a root. Um, desiring to be rich, many have fallen into temptation verses 9 onwards 9 and 10 um and 
they have opened themselves and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Okay. Um, so he's saying, but you, you pastor Timothy, you man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Okay. So don't pursue love of money, pursue these things. Okay. Um, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. Okay. So all that. And then he goes on to uh, say in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be proud, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, Let them do good, and they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, uh, storing up for themselves a good foundation. So, so the, the, there's a thin line, there's a fine line, we know that money is important. We know that money is, uh, uh, you know, necessary. It's a necessity, um, but there is a thin line between, uh, like we studied in the financial uh, stewardship course. There's a thin line between uh, a fine line that we should know. We should uh, because when you cross that line, then you then you start putting your trust in riches, and you start pursuing without you realizing that there is developing in you a love for money. Um, because you realize the you know necessity and importance of it, but you're saying don't put your trust in riches because riches can be uncertain. So he says, don't put your trust in uncertain riches. So, um, so uh, for Timothy, you know all these instructions um, for the pastoral ministry. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's look at um, very quickly. You know, maybe move on to the second epistle. And uh, let's look at a few um, instructions there also, right? Um, uh, chapter one, you know, Second Timothy, chapter one, verse six. Again, the, the uh, he reminds Timothy to stir up the gift of God, which is in him. Um, and he says, "For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind." So you know, you understand that uh, the importance of being rooted in the Word the importance of moving in the things of the Spirit. Right? And the reason is that the ministry might be effective, fruitful, and would result in edification of the people. Right? That's the intention. Right? And, and that you see that's the emphasis. You know, give yourself entirely to the doctrine. You know, um, hold on to those pattern of sound words that you heard from me and commit these to others who are able to each other's also so the the whole thing em emphasis of you know being rooted in the word and being open to the ministry of the holy spirit you know and and go into that you know don't neglect that don't neglect that aspect because it results in edification of people edification of the church for which the pastor is there you know god has raised up the person um just for that right and the ministry Look, takes care of that, so therefore don't uh, ignore it, right? Um, verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words, okay? Um, that was, uh, that you heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. And that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit, right? Whatever was committed. Um, so I'm just keeping a few verses there and, uh, and going on to chapter two, saying, be strong in the grace um, that is, uh, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, verse 2. And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So um, here again, uh, the, uh, the raising up of leaders, equipping uh, people and raising, up, raising them up to be spiritual leaders so that they can in turn uh, mentor, teach uh, others. Right? So, so he's saying, you know, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And of course, the end of that teaching is edification, that they might discover their call, that they might. Uh, when, so when you say teaching, it's uh, it's both, you know, teaching, demonstration, uh, impartation, um, everything, you know. Uh, for them to have an encounter with God, right? So that is what was the teaching of um, Paul, or the uh, the way in which he ministered was that, right? Uh, we see uh, a classic example: the church in Corinth. Right? Spent one and a half years there, or more, 
And by the end of it, the church was exposed to the gospel. I mean, the, they, they were exposed to the word of God, rooted in the word of God, and exposed to the work of the spirit and moving in the gifts of the spirit. Okay, so when we say teaching, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, not just passing on information uh, so that they are, uh, you know, they are uh, instructed uh, group, but it involves all that, all that impartation, encounter with God, right? So he's saying you, you commit these to others who will be able to teach others also. Okay, so we'll take a break and then we'll come back. <laughs> 